Welcome to the Fraser Institute's Conversation Series. I'm Leah Costello. We're delighted to have the Right Honourable Nigel Lawson join us here today. Lord Lawson was a journalist before entering politics and serving in Margaret Thatcher's government until 1989. He's here to discuss his book, An Appeal to Reason, a cool look at global warming. Thank you, Lord Lawson, for joining us here today. Well, thank you for inviting me. So the global warming issue has many dimensions. There's the scientific aspect, political, economic. I'd like to ask you a few questions about the science. The UN's IPCC summary proclaims a scientific consensus. Could you comment on that? There is clearly not a scientific consensus. There is a majority view. There could hardly not be a majority view. There's always a majority on one side or the other. But uh, there's no consensus. An interesting evidence of that was the survey that was conducted uh, a little while back by Hans von Storck, who is a professor at the Meteorological Institute of Hamburg University. And he polled a large number of scientists, a very large number, hundreds and hundreds of climate, accredited climate scientists around the globe. And he asked them a number of questions. The key question on was, uh, do you agree that the warming that happened in the 20th century uh, was mostly due to man, man's activities. And uh, it was only mostly, not entirely due, but even so, what happened was that uh, two-thirds, basically, of the, those who replied said, yes, we do agree. One-third said, we don't agree. One-third is a very substantial minority indeed. It shows clearly that there is no consensus. And uh, the other thing, which of course uh, we are frequently told by Al Gore and others, which is equally untrue, which is linked to this, is the science is certain. The science is not certain, it's not settled. Uh, not settled at all. And there's continuing discussion among climate scientists. And I don't blame them for the fact that it's not settled. It's an extremely complex area, climate science. So based on the facts that you know, have you concluded that global warming is real? I don't know what uh, is likely to happen in the future. What I do know is that there was a warming of about half a degree centigrade in the last quarter of the 20th century, according to the statistics. That the same people who produce the same statistics have shown that so far this century there's been no further warming at all. What I am clear about, however, and we'll no doubt come on to this, is that even if it does happen, and it may and it may not, even if it does happen, then the policies that we're told we must adopt don't make sense. So when you look at the long-term forecasts regarding the economic impact that some of these proposals to reverse global warming have, what do you see? What I see is that if we are going to decarbonize our economies, which is what we're told we need to do in stages. This is extremely expensive, extremely costly. It is also, of course, uh, worse than costly. If you look at the developing world, and China now is the biggest emitter, bigger even than the United States. But why should they do it? Look at what it means to them. It means that they have to slow down their economic development. Now, the reason for that is that the reason that we use carbon energy it is not because the oil companies tell us to or whatever. It is because it is the cheapest available source of energy. And if you go from cheap energy to more expensive energy, you slow down your development. And for those countries, with so many people in dire poverty, it actually means perpetuating uh, them in poverty, in malnutrition, in disease, longer than is necessary taking longer for them to emerge from this. And that is, I think, unethical, and they're not prepared to do it. It's because the cost is so great that you have this row going on. And so you suggest that we should focus instead on adaptation instead of trying to reverse or intervene in global warming. Could you elaborate on that? The, everybody, even the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, although they're a bit grudging about it, who are the sort of international global authority on this, except that warming uh, does bring benefits as well as bringing disadvantages. Benefits for food production, benefits for uh, health. Uh, so you get a lot of benefits 
but you would also get some disadvantages. Uh, possibly, you might get an increase in tropical diseases, for example. So you should, uh, by adaptation, what I mean is attacking tropical diseases at the root cause and eradicating them. That can be done. Malaria, for example, which is probably the most widespread tropical disease, killing millions of people still a year. Uh, you attack the malaria. In other uh, things, for example, if, and it's an if, but it might happen, if tropical storms get worse because of the sea getting warmer, then what do you need to do? You need to do what you need to do anyway about tropical storms and hurricanes, and that is have adequate levees and adequate sea defences. So you create these, which you need to do anyway, because there is a problem in the tropics with tropical storms and hurricanes anyway. So, and that's another point about the adaptation approach, because none of the problems of warming, should it occur, are new problems. They are merely the slight exacerbation of problems and, uh, which already exist. And so these need to be addressed anyway, so let's do that. So is the issue really environmental or does the global warming movement have some other motives? Those who don't like the idea really of a free economy, don't like the idea of the capitalist system or the market system and believe that unless governments are running things, uh, it's no good uh, with controls and regulations and all sorts of things of that kind. And uh, it is very difficult, despite the economic mess that we're in in the world at the moment, at the moment it is very difficult to say, for anybody to say, uh, that the market economy is inferior to the command economy. Nobody in their right minds can, can justify all this government intervention on economic grounds. So they have to look at for some other reason mm -hmm. to justify intervention and uh, interference and regulation and so on. And climate change gives them a reason for doing that. Mm -hmm. The second thing which uh, I think has come together with it is uh, the fact a natural politician's desire to look good. Uh, the politicians uh, like to, the, to be respected by the public. Maybe we're living in an age where they're not as respected as they were once upon a time. So if they can say, look, we, you know, you may not be too pleased with the way we're performing over the economy or crime or whatever it is, but we are saving the planet. So it, it, the, the, the politicians do it in order to look good and sound good, and the media do it because scare stories are, for them, bad news is good news. Is that we now in the West, uh, are in a, the most secular society that there has ever been. Uh, and this has become a kind of new quasi-religion with all the apparatus of religion, you know, the end of the world is nigh and uh, if we, and man is wicked and if man doesn't mend his ways, the most terrible things will happen. You know, it fits into a religious narrative that's always been there and is a, is a is a kind of new religion. That's why people say, do you believe in global warming? So it does fill this vacuum and all these things come together, I think help to explain why it is had such a salience, why there is, it is such a big thing in world uh, politics today. The trouble is that if you move from rhetoric to reality and actually pursue the policies that the rhetoric uh, leads to, then it will be very costly and very, very damaging indeed. And that is uh, what I am anxious that we shouldn't do. We have enough real problems uh, on our hands, uh, economic problems and indeed other problems, without becoming obsessed with this at huge economic cost, huge cost to living standards and of course something which, as I say, even if we think we can afford, but I don't see why we should uh, burden ourselves in that way, uh, the developing world can't. Thank you so much for well, joining us here much today. For me. And thank you for joining us. For more information on this issue, please visit our website, FraserInstitute.org, and also make sure that you subscribe for future videos at our YouTube channel, Fraser Institute, or on our website, FraserInstitute.org slash multimedia. Thanks again, and we'll see you next time. Thank you.